Now, our next guest says that we are getting worse, not better, at handling disasters, like the pandemic, for instance. Historian Neil Ferguson's new book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, sets 2020 into wider context and asks why many countries' initial responses to COVID were too slow. Here he is talking with Walter Isaacson about how we got here and what he thinks the next big disaster will be. Thank you, Christian and Neil Ferguson. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Walter. You know, this book has a very jarring beginning. You're talking about doom throughout history. And you were at Davos at the World Economic Forum in January of last year, and you've been traveling around, you've been traveling to Asia, and yet you also had a sense that this pandemic was going to get bad. You were talking about it there when everybody else was ignoring it. And then you ended up getting sick. In retrospect, tell me what were you thinking then and you know what should you have been thinking in terms of the networks you were traveling in? Well, one of the themes of doom, which is a, a general history of disaster, is that we are not very good as human beings at thinking about disaster. We, we struggle a bit with the probabilities. And we struggle a bit with the, the frequency of really big disasters. And as individuals, we struggle because of cognitive dissonance to modify our behavior rapidly. And I wanted to be very frank about that kind of dissonance in my own life back in January uh, and February. I was traveling a great deal, uh, beginning in fact in Asia. I was in Hong Kong and Singapore and Taipei right at the beginning of the year. And then I went off to Europe to the World Economic Forum and then came back to the US. And I was aware from early on that there was a significant probability that this new mysterious coronavirus in Wuhan was going to be the cause of a pandemic, but it was difficult to adjust my behavior accordingly. I was very self-conscious when I got hold of a mask about wearing it uh, on planes uh, in, in January and February because you would get some strange looks. And of course, if you were wearing the mask, it, it made people wonder if you were actually very sick. And I can remember wearing it and then sort of embarrassedly uh, taking it off. Embarrassment's a powerful force in, in the determination of, of human behavior, especially if you're, if you're British. And it, it took me a while to take the decision to stop uh, the traveling uh, and, in fact, to move my family to a, a, a very low-density area of the United States, Montana. And I look back and I think, was I a super spreader? You know, was I one of those people who was actually spreading the virus? And I'll never know, Walter, because there was no testing available at that time in the US. I'll never find out if I actually would have tested positive right at the beginning. In your book, you describe how science will make many advances, like two steps forward in figuring out how to do vaccines or to treat diseases. And yet society then takes a step back because we get more networked. Explain how that dynamic played out this time around? Well, historically, that's certainly true. One of the reasons that the great plagues in history happened, uh, for example, in the time of the Roman Empire, was precisely that communications for trade and other purposes were uh, at, at new highs because of the uh, expansion and integration of, of the Roman Empire. Uh, and you get a similar story, actually, in the, in the 14th century, when the worst of all pandemics happens, the Black Death. That's, that's because trade routes and pilgrimage routes really connected really large parts of Eurasia and made sure that once a pathogen got to Europe, it was pretty quickly all over Europe and all across uh, the British Isles. In our time, what happened was that at some point in late 2019, uh, a new coronavirus began to spread in the city of Wuhan and, and in Hubei province. And for weeks, the Chinese authorities, for reasons that we'll remember from the movie uh, Chernobyl, uh, covered it up uh, and discouraged uh, doctors, often uh, quite aggressively, from talking about it. And in those fateful weeks, uh, Chinese uh, families were traveling uh, not only, uh, only over China, but all over the world because of the approaching Chinese Lunar New Year. It's a peak time of travel from China to the United States, uh, January. And it wasn't until January the 23rd, long after this virus had spread to most parts uh, of the world, that, uh, that the Chinese authorities imposed, imposed a lockdown. So I think this illustrates a really key point. We tend to think of our battle 
uh, with disease as something uh, which is one in successive medical breakthroughs by brilliant scientists. And that is part of the story, no question about it. But at the same time, because we've been globalizing the world, uh, really since the 18th and 19th century time of empires, we've made ourselves more and more vulnerable to a novel pathogen. Uh, and that, I think, is the big takeaway uh, of, uh, of COVID-19, that we, we didn't have circuit breakers in place quickly to turn off flows in case of a novel pathogen. And only those countries that acted really, really quickly, like Taiwan, for example, were able to get a handle on this. Those of us who remained basically open, United States and the United Kingdom, and Ended up being hit very hard indeed. The economist Amartya Sen uh, says that uh, democracies prevent famines. Do you think democracies are inherently better at preventing pandemics as well? Well, that was the question that I began to ponder. Uh, there never had been a kind of general history of disasters, but I'd certainly read Amartya Sen's work on famine years ago and had been persuaded of his central point that, that famines are not really natural disasters. They, they happen because, for a variety of reasons, political systems fail to respond uh, to localized uh, or regional shortages. And, and then I find myself wondering, well, if democracies are good at famines, shouldn't they be good at all forms of disaster? And it turns out that they're not, or at least they're capable of screwing up certain kinds of disaster quite badly. Uh, if you stop making a distinction between natural and man-made disasters and recognize that all disasters have certain common properties, I think what you notice is that actually democracies can be quite myopic because for some sorts of disaster, you have to prepare long-term and you have to make costly investments ahead of the disaster and quite possibly if you're successful the disaster won't happen and then where's the payoff i mean i learned this uh, from henry kissinger a man we've both studied kissinger's problem of conjecture which he formulated in the 1960s before he'd really been in government was that there are asymmetric payoffs if you're a democratic leader because it's easy just to kick the can down the road take the line of least resistance and hope you get lucky but to take the decisions that would properly have prepared the United States for a pandemic, rather than like taking the decisions that would properly prepare the United States for climate change, is bound to be expensive. And politicians don't like things that are really expensive, which is, of course, why the new administration has bought the theory of modern monetary theory and, and basically is acting like it can spend without ever having to pay for the things it, it's, it's spending on. So I think democracies have a bigger problem than maybe a March Sen's theory for famines implied. Also, if you look at wars, uh, one of the central failures of the 20th century was Britain's failure to deter Germany from attempting two major and risky bids for power in, in Europe. And I wonder if the United States is in the process of making the same mistake with respect to China. Because if you ask me what's the next big disaster, I don't think it's imminent climate change disaster. I think it's imminent conflict between the US and China, because ultimately we're not really deterring the Chinese uh, from an increasingly aggressive policy, especially towards countries like Taiwan. Well, do you think that a Cold War with China is inevitable and perhaps even desirable? Well, I think it's begun. So it's kind of uh, after the fact to discuss whether or not it's inevitable. I think it's been going since at least 2018. And by the way, I think the Chinese know this because whenever I say this to any uh, any Chinese representative, they don't disagree. The, the thing about Cold War is that it's, it's preferable to hot war. Uh, and our choice is not between Cold War or uh, Kumbaya uh, cordiality. Uh, China's clearly challenging the United States in pretty much uh, every domain, and much as the Soviet Union did beginning in the late 1940s. And we don't really have a choice to be uh, in some kind of uh, fraternal friendship with them anymore. The question is, how do you deal with this Chinese challenge in ways that avert World War III? That's really what Cold War strategy was about, preventing escalation to a full-scale superpower conflict, which would be catastrophic for the world. And I think that's the argument for Cold War. The alternative is that we stumble into a hot war, maybe over an issue like Taiwan. And, and that's why I think one of the key lessons of, of doom is that the disasters that you need to worry about are wars, and especially uh, totalitarian regimes. After all, 
the biggest cause of excess mortality and of premature death in the 20th century was not natural disaster. It was man-made disaster in the form of totalitarian regimes and the wars that they started or participated in. I was struck in your book about there's two types of grand dooms we've faced over the centuries. One are wars and the other are great pandemics. And sometimes they go together. I hadn't really thought about the fact that in the Peloponnesian War, Pericles survives, but he's killed by the plague. Uh, to what extent do wars and plagues go together? It happens then, it happens in 1918. It even happened in some ways during the Black Death of the 14th century. That's right. I mean, not, not only is plague a major actor in the Peloponnesian War, as uh, Thucydides describes it, and it's one of the most vivid descriptions of a plague and also the earliest, but we also find that in the 1340s, the fact of a devastating plague, which was killing 40% of the population of most European countries, didn't get in the way of the Hundred Years' War uh, between uh, England and France, which got going in that same decade. 1918-19 was the worst uh, plague of modern times with uh, something like 39 or 40 million deaths, which would be 160 million in the 2020 uh, population. Uh, it, it began on American army bases, as far as we can figure out, and was spread initially by troop ships crossing the Atlantic. The thing about wars is that armies march on their stomachs, as Napoleon famously said, parasites, pathogens, uh, viruses travel on their backs. Armies are great super spreaders uh, in their way. And many wars, if you think back through history, uh, come to an end, not because of the defeat of one side by the other, but because both sides are exhausted by disease. That happened regularly in, in European history uh, in the 17th and, and 18th centuries. And it wasn't really until the 20th century that we began to to be able to defeat disease so that armies could keep fighting. But even if you look back at the end of World War I, which we tend to attribute to the military success of, of Britain and its allies, uh, the United States playing a key role, it's quite possible that the reason the German army collapsed in the summer of 1918 was that their, uh, their ranks were being ravaged by the Spanish influenza. As you say, in the summer of uh, 1918, we come out of World War I and we have this huge pandemic. And then shortly thereafter, we have, I guess I'd call them ideological pandemics, you know, Bolshevism and Russian backed communism and uh, the spread of uh, authoritarianism, even Nazism starts to rise. Are those connected? I think they are. And one of the themes of a book I wrote about 10 years ago, War of the World, was that there were two plagues uh, at the end of World War I, the Spanish influenza, as it was known, and the plagues of the mind, uh, of which Bolshevism was the first to get going, but fascism wasn't far behind. So I think if we look at our own experience, we can see something rather similar, where the, the, the virus caused its contagion, but at the same time, there were contagions of, uh, of ideas, um, ideas which uh, included conspiracy theories, as we've already discussed. But the con contagion of the mind that caused the great protests of last summer was somewhat familiar to, to my historian's eyes. When you think about it, it was kind of strange to have mass protests in hundreds of cities on the issue of, of police violence and, and race relations following the murder of, of George Floyd. In the midst of a pandemic, to be protesting about that issue was strange. Uh, and I think there was something of that, that medieval mood of expiation in the protests of, of last summer that you saw in the 1340s when penitent, flagellant orders uh, marched around Europe, flogging themselves in the hope of warding off divine vengeance. If you look closely at the protests of last year, there was all kinds of religious undertones there. Uh, so I think often in times of plague, there's an urge for expiation to kind of confess one's uh, sins. Most of the protesters last year were white, and they were protesting against uh, their own or their own uh, uh, past racism. But you're not trying to compare the racial protests of the past year to some of the stranger penitents that of the Middle Ages, are you? Well, there are clearly enormous differences, and the, and the issue is a, is a real one. Uh, 
clearly. Just, just I think one has to bear in mind that the scale of these protests and the intensity which people felt last year probably would not have occurred in the absence of a pandemic, as well as in the absence of the lockdowns. One has to remember that, that there is a connection here. In time of pandemic, there's a psychological toll, even for those who don't become ill or are only mildly sick. And that psychological stress was greatly increased by the drastic measures that we took. Remember, we missed the opportunity for early uh, detection and early action. And then in mid-March, we decided, oh no, we've lost control, let's lock everything down. That imposed a heavy psychological toll on the population on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think it wasn't surprising that after a certain point, the, the pressure cooker boiled over. Well, the title of the book is Doom. Does that mean you think that we are doomed to repeat these things? Or is there some way these lessons might help us prevent the next crisis, the next uh, uh, problem we'll face? Well, we can't prevent crises and disasters. They, they will continue to befall us. And they'll do it at inconvenient and unpredictable intervals that will catch us out. Um, and one of the lessons of the book is, I'm afraid there's no cyclical theory of history that will help you forecast the next pandemic, or for that matter, the next enormous earthquake in, in California, or the next supervolcano in Montana. There are any number of disasters that could befall us. And unfortunately, we can't have probabilities because they're just not that easy to anticipate. But uh, what we can do is be better responsive. We can be quicker on our feet when disaster strikes. And that's really why I wrote this book even before the pandemic was over. It's not really a book about the pandemic. It's a book about how we deal with disaster as a species. And I think if we've got worse at that, and I do think we've got worse at that in many Western countries, then we need to learn some lessons. Because the next disaster won't necessarily be the one that we're preparing for. Huge amounts of effort go into discussing and preparing for a climate change. This is the number one issue. It was the number one issue at Davos back in January 2020 when the pandemic was beginning. I don't downplay those risks, but it's not the only form that disaster can take in the next 50 years. And indeed, I suspect there are a lot more faster acting forms of disaster out there that we should worry about. Just think of the recent attack on the colonial pipeline, a cyber attack probably by a Russian group that's paralyzed uh, the transmission of, of a crucial source of energy across the East Coast of the United States. That's a trailer for one of the next disasters we're likely to face. Because in the event of a major conflict with China, there's no question that, that one of the things the other side will do will be to try to attack our critical infrastructure through the internet. So my general view is, let's prepare not just for the one crisis that we think a lot about, let's not prepare for the wrong disaster. Let's try to be generally paranoid and ready for anything because disaster in human history just, just takes many forms. I think there are more than four horsemen of the apocalypse by my count. Neil Ferguson, Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Walter.